All right. Welcome to CS164. This is section number two. I'm Chris Gerber. I'm going to be filling in for Tommy this week. He, uh, he's away at a conference, so he asked me to cover the section. We're going to be covering object-oriented programming, but more specifically, Objective-C, and giving you a little more detail around that and giving you a chance to ask questions, which you may not have got to the chance to ask during lecture. There we go. So I'm going to start off. We're going to show you Xcode, do a little bit with LLDB, the debugger that's built into Xcode. We're going to talk about data types, classes and objects, foundation classes. That's pretty much going to be a review of what you saw in the lecture, but a chance to ask some more questions. And then we'll look at designing a class, jumping off from where David left the uh, student demonstration during class. All right, so first off, we're going to be using Xcode. That's the standard IDE when you're developing Objective-C on a Mac. We're going to be using version 4.3 on Lion. It's downloadable from the Mac App Store. If you're still on Snow Leopard, read the FAQ up on CS164, and that'll tell you a little more about how you can get the current version. But just to see what this looks like real quick. We can go to the App Store. Plenty of choices. <coughs> Xcode is going to be in the free section. And you'll see I already have it installed, but you can install it right from here. All right. The first thing, once you've got Xcode installed, when you launch it, the first area we're going to look at is the navigation view, where you can look at your project, symbols, search, issues, debug, breakpoints, and the log. And let's see what that actually looks like real quick. So I've already launched Xcode on my machine. The icon is this one on your machine. And after it launches, I've already loaded up some code just to get us going. You'll see this left section is the navigation area. So the first view is just your project. This is your files and groups of files. So I've got my main modules, my headers. There are some other, for example, supporting files, a precompiled header in this case, the frameworks that I've included, which is just foundation for our simple example, and the products, which is going to be the actual executable that was output from the process we're going to get to. But some of the areas that you'll look at, you can look at your classes and see the various methods, properties, and instant variables that are within your, your classes. You can do search, where I can search for student and find everywhere it's referenced in my code. You can do issues, which will be compilation issues. And I'll try to find another opportunity to show that when we have some uh, bugs in our code later. I'm sure I won't type everything right. Debugging information, this will come up when we actually go into the debugger, and we'll show it again then. Any currently active breakpoints, and I'll show that as we look at the debugger. And the log of what's been happening. So I, I had built this, built the debug version of my project, and committed the items just before class, just to make sure I had some source code to show you guys some of this. So before we jump into seeing a little more there, another key element that you will want to do go, is install the help. So the help, although you can search online, you can install the whole thing local to your machine as well, which is great for if you're on the road coding, you've got your laptop with you. And the documentation is really great, very easy to search. But you do want to make sure you load it up while you have some bandwidth, because it's a pretty huge download. So we're going to go into Xcode, go into the preferences, and into documentation. And I'll show you this. And we'll do a check and install now, and then I'll show you how we can use the organizer to actually view that documentation. So to get it installed, we're going to go right under the Xcode menu, Preferences. And this is the overall preferences for Xcode as an application. But specifically, we're going to go into the downloads. And you can see I've already installed a number of libraries. Most likely, you'll have a few of these installed. Um, 
But specifically, you're going to want to install iOS 5.0 for this course and Xcode 4.3 Developer Library for this course. The ones you haven't installed and that you want will have the little install button. You can just click it. Um, you can also do check and install now, and it will freshen up all of the ones that you've already installed. Once those are installed, you'll want to use the code navigator. I'm sorry. Sorry, the organizer, which on the very far right of Xcode, in the upper right corner, you'll see the actual icon for the organizer. That will launch another window, which has a number of things. And just for today, the only one you have to worry about is your documentation. So in the documentation, you have a search field. So I can say I want to learn more about methods. And it will find all the references and all the documentations for the word methods. And once you find one that seems relevant, you can jump right in and display the documentation. This will be extremely useful as you start going in and exploring some of these items. So if we look at, for example, we talked about NS string in class. You can bring up the documentation for NS string. And learn about some of the additional procedures for things like, for example, if you want to switch between C strings and NS strings. But now let's jump back to uh, the actual Xcode interface. So one of the key things that you're going to want to learn about is the debugging area on the screen. And we're going to get back to the code later, but just to get a sense for the debugging area, it is currently at the bottom of the window. And if you don't see it, David mentioned that you can hide a number of elements of the display. In the very upper right corner, I've gone too far and turned on my screensaver. In the very right corner, you'll see the editor view. And we're still using the, the far left one that David recommended, which is just a single view of your code, as opposed to one of the more advanced views, which will show two pieces of code simultaneously. And then the next three buttons determine whether the, the left information, which was that navigator that we saw, is available. The bottom area, which is where the debugging information is. And the right area, which is all the utilities, whether or not they're displayed. So we don't need the utilities for what we're doing tonight. So we'll turn that off. But I do have the debugging turned on so that we can see this. So if you remember in class, we had this very simple example where we were creating two students, putting them into an array, iterating over the array, and printing out some results based on that iteration. Assuming that you wanted to actually start looking at debugging this information, the first thing you'd want to do is put in a breakpoint. So the easiest way to do that, and just as a starting point for what we're doing tonight, is in the left area where they have the line numbers, that little gutter there if you click on it, we'll add a breakpoint to your code. If it's in the dark blue, it's an active breakpoint, and your code will stop when you get there. Did you have a question? No. OK. If you click it again, it becomes sort of faded or muted there. That's an inactive breakpoint. It's a reminder that at some point you wanted to break in that code, but it's not actually going to break at the moment. And the last thing with breakpoints, real quick, is you can pull them off. And in a little puff of smoke, your breakpoint will be gone. So let's put that breakpoint in again, just to have a starting point for talking about the debugger. And if you remember in class, in the upper left corner, as Dave referred to it, it was the uh, iTunes control. You can run your application from there. So my application compiles, runs. And you'll see that a line in my code is now highlighted in green. So this is basically telling me that We've hit the breakpoint, and this is the currently executing line, or the next line that will execute. If we go to the bottom of the screen, you'll see that we're starting to see some variables in the bottom section. And the output has only displayed one thing now, but it's got this LLDB prompt. And this is not your static output. 
this is actually a little interactive console that you can use. So from LLDB, there's a number of simple things that you can do. You can add new breakpoints, view existing breakpoints, output the values of variables and objects, um, step into your code, step over lines of code, or just start the code running, running again. So for example, I may want to add another breakpoint. And I can say, as soon as I get into my for loop, I want to stop the code before I print that first greet. So that's going to be line 33. I can use B for a breakpoint. I actually need to tell it the name of my file. So this file is currently main.m. And I want to stop when I get to line 33. And you'll see now that another breakpoint has been created, main.m, line 33. One thing you will notice is that it doesn't update the GUI. LLDB is running separately from the GUI at this time. So you won't see a new blue arrow. But the breakpoint is, in fact, active. Some other things I can do. I can now list those breakpoints that I have. To list the breakpoints, that'll be BRL, BR space L, for list. And that will show me the two breakpoints that currently exist, the one that we created graphically and the one that we just created from the command line or from the console there. I can continue to delete a breakpoint. So I could say I no longer need that first breakpoint anymore. So let's BR breakpoint delete one. That breakpoint will be deleted. And when we list again, you'll see there's just the, uh, the second one that we had created. So far, not too exciting, but uh, very helpful as you get into your code. The next thing you can do is step over an instruction. I'm going to try to make this so you can see both at the same time. There we go. So n moves to the next instruction. So we're currently at the very top line of the screen, 23. The next instruction takes us to line 26. The other, so the other thing you can do is step over an instruction with s. The difference is actually important. So if we step over, it's going to look the same for this first time that we do it. I'm sorry, step into, not step over. Next would step over. So s is step into. When you step into, instead of moving to the next visible line in your code, it goes to the next actually running line of your code. So if you remember the, the code from class, init with name was a function that we had written. And by stepping into the code, I'm actually looking at that code now as opposed to my main.m. So we're currently in the student.m file in the first line of this function from our main.m. So just jumping back to our main.m, you'll see that this init with name is the function that was running and that we just stepped into. So we can continue along. There we go. With additional nexts. One thing you'll start seeing is in this left section down here, you'll start to see the values of variables changing. So these are the active variables in scope at this point in my code. So self we talked about quickly in class is the current object. So this is the student object that I'm currently working with. Age is the value passed into the function, which was just an integer. In this case, the integer of 20. And name was an NS string object with a value of Alice, which was passed in from that main.m as well. And you can see those were the parameters to this message up here. The other thing you'll see 
is that because we've started doing these self.variable assignments, the internally represented value of age at this point has been assigned to 20, but name has not yet been assigned a value. We've told the, the message that it's going to be Alice, but it hasn't been set yet because we're waiting for that line of code to run. And as soon as we do a next, you'll see that that's updated as well. Now there's actually two, there's another way where you can see these values. So for standard variables, you can also simply print the value. So P is print, and we can say age. And down here in the corner, P age prints out the 20, which is the current value of age. For objects, if you simply printed an object, all you're going to get is its ID number. And that's specifically because it is an object. So what we need to do is use the print object command instead, PO. And that will not only tell us the ID number, but will understand that we want to see the contents of that object and we get Alice out as well. But you can also do all sorts of creative things as well. You could put in an object with messages passed to it, calculate it on the fly and just see what would have happened or actually make changes to your object on the fly. You can do a lot of powerful things with the debugger here that you might not as easily do in the visual interface. The other thing that you can do on the visual side though is if you right click an object, you can do print description of the object, which is exactly the same as PO. But this becomes handy when you start looking at more complex objects. So for example, when we get to having an array of students, we can start to see the list of the actual student names as opposed to just seeing that it's an array. All right, the last command I want to throw out for the debugger for now is the C command, which is short for continue and that will run the program until its end, or at least until it hits the next breakpoint. So those are referenced in the, uh, the slide deck for later, so you don't have to remember everything I say. So the language itself, we're gonna start getting more into the language rather than just looking at it and just assume that my code works. The language is a strict superset of C, so that means that any C program is also an objective C program. It doesn't mean that every objective C program would be a C program, but but the idea of the superset fits. There are two major implementations, and Xcode has used both now. Originally, Xcode was GCC-based. Now it's Clang-based. Um, and as David had mentioned in class, the, the big difference is, although GCC is actually a little bit faster as a compiler, Clang, and specifically LLVM, provides a lot more information back to the IDE, so you can get better um, error information, warning information, assistance with your code while you're working. The other thing to keep in mind is that although Objective-C seems to be predominantly on OS X as a platform, being used for the iPhones and for the Macs, it's not an OS X specific or OS X specific language. So you might also want to look at uh, New Step, which is taken from the original next step, but it's a, a full new version of it, which um, is available for Linux, can compile onto a Windows machine, et cetera. All right, primitives. So primitives, just to jump back, are those inherent variable types that are, that are built into the language. So we have some of the things that we've seen in the past through other languages. So we have the idea of an int, which is a standard integer. We've got floats. We've got doubles, cars. All these things are still that C notation that you're used to. We do have two sort of newish ones. Bool is a Boolean, but in Objective-C they use yes and no as opposed to a true and false notation, which it's one of those things where you wonder why they, they had to go against the grain, but once you get used to it, it's not a big deal. The other one that's very interesting is this idea of an ID. And an ID, as David had mentioned, is essentially like a void pointer, but it ultimately has a little more functionality. And there's a special ID, this nil, which is essentially a null object, but it has the, the intrinsic value of 
not only does it say that the object is nothing, but it becomes a sinkhole for messages, which becomes very important in Objective-C. In Objective-C, basically, instead of function calls, we have messages. So you say, this is what I want you to do. These are the values I'm passing you. And you send it off, and then the object may or may not receive it. So you really have to check to, to see if what you thought was going to happen did happen. And specifically because of things like nil, where if you have a nil object, it will safely accept that message and dispose of it. So instead of getting a seg fault because you're sending something to a null pointer, it gracefully just ignores what you're doing, which becomes very handy. It's a, a nice little safety net there. All right. When we get to strings, the string is no longer a primitive. You can still use an array of characters, but NS string is a much more powerful implementation where the string is stored as an object. And this is a lot more like Java. As I mentioned, it's implemented by NS string. And when you define strings in your code, you're going to use the at symbol before you put the quotes. So text in quotes would be seen as an array of characters. Text in quotes with an at in front of it is seen as create an object of NS string type with this value as a starting point. Formatting is much the same as in C, where in C you would use printf or sprintf, and you would use replacement patterns such as percent %d if you wanted to display an int, or percent %f for a float, or percent %c for a car. In Objective-C, we also add one more which is this, for NS objects, you can use percent %at, and that will print the value of the object, which in many cases is just the ID, but you can actually override a function called description that would provide a sort of human-friendly version of that object as well. And if we have time, I'll show you that at the end. The other thing on this slide I want to point out is we have a function called NSLog, which basically dumps out some sort of text to the console similar to how we would use console.log in JavaScript. Because tonight we're just looking at code that is running as a, a command line application, that's just going to dump right out to uh, the standard output on the, on the device. All right. So in C, you have the idea of headers and your actual code. Here we're going to have the interface and the implementation which is the same idea. So the interface is your .h file. It's where you define your class instance variables, your methods. And we'll see it in the code, but just quickly, it looks sort of like this. We have at interface, class name, whatever parent. So if you're um, subclassing from something else, you can define the parent. You'd have a number of instant variables, which would have a type and then a name. So your instance variable might be an NS string to store the name of an individual, or an int to store the age of an individual, as in our case. And then you have a number of methods, which have a return type and then a method name. And we'll show more about the full notation for uh, methods when we get there. But th for the interface, all you need is just that header that shows the names of the methods that you will be expecting in your implementation. And then we close it up with an at end at the end of the section. On the implementation side, we define the actual class, class, class methods. So this is a .m file, parallel to how you would have a .c file in C. Similar structure, we've got at implementation in this case, the name of the class. You'd have your, your method names as you had dis, uh, created them in your interface but then you would also have the implementation within them as well. And David had also talked about this idea of properties. So properties are sort of a special construct in Objective-C just to make your life a little bit easier. So we've talked about the idea of using getters and setters. When you use properties, you basically have to use getters and setters to access them. It will create a getter for you of the structure, um, return value, name, and it will just return the value of 
of that item. The setter works similarly, but instead of just the name, it prefixes it with set, capitalizes the name, and allows you to uh, set the value, in this case, just with an assignment. But we can see that there's, a, or we will see that there's other things other than just assignment when we get into the details. If you want the code to generate those setter, getters and setters for you, you set up the app property, you give it some attributes, and we'll look at those, and then give the property a name. But then in the implementation, you just tell it to do at synthesize property name and actually ideally assign a backend instance variable to store the value in. And it will take care of writing the code for the getters and setters behind the scenes for you, which uh, becomes really nice, especially if you've programmed in a language like Java where you've spent a lot of time just cutting and pasting code. And then once you've done that, you also get access to this dot notation so that you can very easily access the values of your variables and do assignments as well. All right, so I mentioned properties have these different attributes. Some of the key ones that we'll be looking at are non-atomic. So a property can either be non-atomic or you just don't specify it. Atomicity is essentially whether multiple things will try to access the same value at the same time, potentially. So if you have a multi-threaded application where two threads of code could try to change a variable at the same time or interfere with each other in some way, you need to protect that variable from getting stomped on. If you know that's not the case, which is going to be the uh, our situation for a while, you can just go, say this is non-atomic, Things won't be synchronized, but it'll be much faster and it's a lot less overhead. So it's certainly worth doing. The other two are read-only and read-write. Basically, read-only, when you specify it, tells it that we want a getter to be generated, but we don't need a setter. If it's read-write, we need both a getter and a setter to be generated for us. Just as a quick side note, even if it generates both a getter and setter for us, we still have the option to override both the getter and the setter with our own custom code if we want to do something different. All right, this is where things, I think, get the most confusing initially in Objective-C. Method arguments. And once you get used to it, it really is great and it does read nicely, but uh, it's, it's gonna take a minute. So, if you have no arguments, you just have the return type and the method name. So that's very straightforward. If you have a single argument, it's not too bad. You have the return value, the method name, the value you're passing in, and the type of the value you're passing in. Which is still a little strange format-wise, but it, it sort of still makes sense. Where it gets a little more convoluted is when you get to multiple arguments. So you have your return value, the method name, which has an initial integer in this case that's gonna be stored in a value called bar, but we haven't really otherwise named this. But to add a next parameter, we give it a key, the variable it's gonna go into, and the type. And these keys, it, it's sort of getting to the idea of you're actually sort of passing in a dictionary, but the first item has no key name. And I think it'll be a lot more clear if we don't spend a lot of time looking at foo and bar and baz and all that and look at some actual method names. So uh, we'll certainly do that when we jump into the code here. But trust me, we'll come back and it'll make a lot more sense. All right, so to call a method, what we're really doing is passing a message. Same basic idea, but the, the main difference is when you pass a message, a message can be disposed of. It may not receive the destination or make it to the destination. So it's almost like you're thinking of a network connection. You send something out on the wire, you hope the server's gonna get back to you, but there, there are valid reasons why that might not be the case. Ideally, the message will respond. The, the other key thing to look at here is the message receiver is resolved at runtime. So it's gonna look at what's going on in the runtime system and determine where that message goes. So there's no type checking at compile time and the object may not respond. 
But to send these messages, you pick the object you want to send the message to. You specify the method, as we had seen in the, the previous slide, and the argument you're going to pass to it. And then if you have an additional value, it will have a key name and a value to pass to it. All right. When you first instantiate your classes, you need to first allocate memory for the object that you're creating, and then you need to assign any initialized, like baseline initialization values to the object. So alloc is going to be used to reserve that memory. And it's as simple as passing that one method name, alloc, directly to the object. You don't have to specify size, anything like that. You just have to say, object alloc inside the square brackets. The other thing you'll do is, I mentioned, initialize it. So sometimes you'll see just a bare init, which will be a generic initialization. Sometimes you'll see this init with something syntax. So in class, we looked at the student class, and we said init with name and age. And you can pass in those parameters as part of the initialization. In either case, it's going to return a pointer to the object if the object was successfully created. All right. A few more property attributes you should know about, but we aren't going to have to worry too much about the details today. There's four attributes for how the memory is managed when you allocate an object. And it's actually not when you first allocate it, it's when you use it later, but we'll, we'll see that. So assign says that this property is going to be just use the equal sign to set this to that. So that's if you're passing in like an, an int or something like that, where you don't have to do anything special to store those bits of data in another field. Copy says I want to take the object that's been passed to me, use the, the copy message on the object to create a new instantiation in memory, and I'm going to save that when I uh, take that data in. And then strong and weak, we're not going to spend a lot of time on until maybe another two weeks from now. But just know that for tonight, we're just going to use strong, and that's going to store a reference to the object. So that's basically like storing the pointer. If someone passes me a string and I use strong, it's going to assign that string into my object. But if someone manipulates that same object from another piece of code, it's going to manipulate what I've stored because I've only got the pointer, not the actual data. All right. So once we've got our code and we want to use other classes, we're going to have to tell our code that we have other classes. So on the interface side, we just use at class and the name of the class and it will sort that out for us. On the implementation side, we would use import and the class.h. So that's similar to include in C. Um, but basically, it uh, automatically handles deduplication. If it gets included in multiple places, it, it takes care of bringing that all together. So I th let me do two more, well, three more slides, and then we'll get over to the code, get to the good stuff. So just three objects that we're going to use tonight, just so you have a little more background on them. The first is NSString, which we talked about a little bit. We've got a few key methods that are going to help us tonight. So you can use init with string, which is basically the same thing as we're doing in our, our at quote quote notation. You can get the length back by passing in a message of the NSString object message length in brackets, and that'll return us a number for the length of the object. You can do substrings with substring from index and substring to index. You can compare two strings with is equal to string. And then you get to the, the granddaddy of them all here, the, where you start to truly appreciate and, uh, and get worried about the idea of these very long descriptive names. You can do string by replacing occurrences of string to replace a substring of inside a string. Which I think is great that you can tell exactly what you're doing. And with code completion, it's not too bad to type, but it does take a lot of screen real estate. All right, two others, NS mutable array. 
This is um, essentially just an array object. It lets us store a number of objects inside of it. We can init with a number of objects, comma separated, when we're first creating it. We can get the count back. We can check if an NS mutable array contains an object. We can get the index of an object if we give it the object that we're looking for. We can check for the object at an index. So if we give it the index number, we can get the object that's in there. And then we can add and remove objects as well. And similar to that, we've also got an NS mutable dictionary, which is like a, a hash or dictionary, associative array, whatever you want to call it. Again, you can knit with a number of objects. You can get the count. You can check the object for a key. So this is getting to that sort of key value idea of the associative array. You can get all the keys. You can get all the values. And then you can set or uh, remove objects from the mutable dictionary. So now let's get over to the good stuff. Let's get the, uh, the code back up. All right. All right, so when we had last left in class, we were up to this student seven example. And just as a refresher as, to look through this, we had created a prototype for a function that we were using just to greet the students. And then we had our main application. We talked about the fact that you had to include this auto release pool, but it's nothing that we have to worry about at any level of detail tonight or probably for two weeks. But just know that that creates memory to store the objects that are being created. We created an array of students. So this should start to look familiar now. We've got a type being defined. We're going to be creating an NS mutable array. Students is prefixed with an asterisk because it's really just a pointer to this object. And the object itself is coming from here. So we've got two messages being created. The first one is the inner one, and you'll see this pattern, where we tell NS mutable array, we need you to allocate a new mutable array for us. And that just creates some sort of space in memory. And then we take whatever was passed there, and that becomes our new object to pass the message init. And the init is just going to say, just do whatever baseline initialization you need to do so I know that this is ready to go and ready to be used. Does that roughly make sense? OK. Once we've got that object, which is students here on the left, we can pass, we can, sorry, we can call the add object method. And we're going to pass it all of this. So what, have, what is all of this? Well, this pattern looks pretty much the same, right? We still see a class type, we see the alloc, and we see some sort of init. So what we're doing here is creating an actual student object, and we're going to use that as the argument for add object to store into the student's array. That object itself is just allocating a student object, and it's doing this two-part um, setup. So it's got a knit with name as the function, and we're going to pass into that function the ns string Alice. But then we've got this second parameter, which has and age, and it's the value is 20, which is an integer that's going to go into our function. So does that roughly make sense? This whole multiple parameters going in. The first one is just the name of the function. But the name sort of implies what it is. It's got that name hidden in the name of it. And and age is the second parameter to the function, but it's just telling us what the next variable is. Yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, so would the name of the function be init with name or init with name and age? All right, so the question is, is the function init with name or init with name and age? So the actual function, as you would look in the documentation, would be a knit with name colon and age, colon. So those are called selectors in the language. And we'll actually start to use those when you start looking at um, some of the UI design a little more. But yeah, that, it all is part of the name of the function. OK. So we're repeating that same pattern on the next line here for Bob. 
Then we're doing this uh, quick loop on all the objects in the array. So this is like we've seen in other languages. For the students, we're going to pull each one out as a student object into this pointer s. And then once we've got s assigned, we're going to call the greet function with s. And we'll just repeat that loop over and over. So each student will get greeted. And at the very end, like in all your good C functions, you just return zero to the operating system so it's happy and it's, it's closed out the application. Jumping back to the end though, the greet function that had been created takes a student, just uses our nslog function, uses the formatter that we talked about. So we're, this formatter is expecting an ns string, so we've prefixed, prefixed the whole thing with the at. Hello, comma, percent at. So as we mentioned earlier, percent at means I'm going to give you an object to fill into this space. I see that you are percent d years old. So that tells me percent d, I'm going to be expecting an integer to be filled into that space. And the two parameters are the name, which we know is an n string, and the age, which we know is an integer. So just to confirm that this still worked when uh, David left it for us, we run the code. And at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that we've iterated over the two lines, hello, Alice, and hello, Bob. All right. So where do we go from here? This is great. We've got a class that works. But what I'd like to do next is create a new class and show you how some of these things start to interact together. So we know how to do students now. Let's go ahead and create a new class for teaching fellows. So we're going to go to, yep. Could you repeat it? Yes, so the question is, is a knit name a custom constructor for students? And yes, I didn't show the uh, student, where was this? Student.m file. So let's look at that, just so we can see that section of the code. So this is the function in question. The starting hyphen at the beginning of the line actually tells us that this is an instance function as opposed to a class function. So this means we can only run this function when we have some instantiated student in memory to work with. Which means, you know, we, we started with student alloc. That was our instantiation. We created some memory for it. Now we can run this function on it. It's going to return an ID. So we're just saying this is going to be some sort of object. In this case, it's going to be a student object. The init with name is the name of the function. It's going to take a name, which is a type, and a string, and it's a pointer. And it's going to take that second parameter again, which is and age, where age is an integer. And it's going to go through. Because this is descended from an NS object, we actually have to respect NS object and let it do whatever initiation it wants to do as well. So the first thing we're going to do, let me move my cursor, is check. We're going to run super is the super, uh, super class that was working with it. And init says, you can run your initialization on this first. As long as that comes back with an object, I'm going to assign it to myself. And then I've got a valid object that I can start manipulating. So in this case, I'm just assigning self's age to the age that was passed into the function and self.name to the name that was passed into the function and returning the object itself. All right. So if I wanted to start my next class, the first thing I want to do is do a new file. And because we're not really dealing with an actual iPhone device yet or any sort of GUI, we're just going to stick with the Mac OS X section for this week. And I'm going to tell it that I want to create a new class. I'm going to give it a name of just 
TF. Every class has some subclass. At the bare minimum, it's going to be NS object, and that's what we're going to use in this case. But if you were taking a class with more functionality and extending that class, you could actually start with something else. And you'll see there's a number of other choices that it thinks of as common choices to start from. It's going to ask me where I actually want to save this file. And that's fine. So I've got this very straightforward TF implementation, which has nothing in it at this time. So let's go over to the header first. So when we think about a teaching fellow, we start thinking about what things a teaching fellow object might need to store. So again, we might need to have a name. So we could create a new property for the name. In this case, I'm just going to copy the object, make it non-atomic. It's going to be an NS string called name. So the copy says when it's passed in a value, save a copy of it, but discard the one that was originally given to me so that if someone manipulates it later, it doesn't affect what I have stored. I might include an array of the students that I have. So just trust me that this is strong. Non-atomic for performance, because we're still single-threaded. And in this case, I'm going to make it read-write. I'm going to make this a mutable array so that we can make changes to it later. And call that students. We might also have office hours, which is going to look very much the same. And we might have a favorite student that we can use later. That would be specifically a student object. And one last thing is just the grades that we've come up with. Just as a quick aside, if I was normally writing this code, I would know that things like strong is the default and rewrite is the default, so I might just only put non-atomic. But for clarity tonight, I want to make sure that you see all the properties that we're working with. And we'll make the grades a dictionary object. All right, so that's the data that's going to be stored in my code. It caught my eye. Now you'll notice we already have an error that the, uh, that the code has come up with. Xcode knows that I've done something wrong. And if you look at the hint here, you see there's a little, I just covered it up, a little arrow underneath student. And it's telling me, that's great, I'd love to use the student object to help you out, but I, I just don't know what it is at this point. So if we bring up the error, you'll see it says, unknown type name, student. What is this? So one of the first things I should have done is because I knew I was going to include a student, I want to tell it that the class student is going to exist and be used here. My error is cleared up. We can continue on. All right, the next key thing I'm going to need to do is come up with what methods this object needs to implement. So again, we'll need, as a starting point, some sort of initialization method. So we'll do init with name. Some name. I'll be able to uh, specify some students when I create the object. Um, I might want to be able to pass in that favorite student when I first create things. 
Trust me, my typing is continuing. There we go. Then we might want to be able to assign some grades or perform the actual grading. Output those grades. Add some office hours. And finally, output the office hours. So again, this is, this is only the interface. So this is just telling me what I'm going to be creating. This is the contract that I'm promising to other pieces of code, that these are the things that will exist. Let's just see what it's complaining about here. And I put the asterisks on the wrong side of a parentheses. All right. Does this roughly make sense? As you know, these are the things that we're going to be working with when we get to the meth to the uh, implementation. Okay. So once we've created the interface, we actually need to implement some of these things that we've created as well. So the first thing, because we made properties, the first thing we're going to want to do is synthesize the properties that we've created. This will automatically handle the creation of our getters and our setters and, and take care of all the, the details of, of dealing with those setters, ed, getters and setters. So for each property that we want to synthesize, we give it the name. And it's good practice to also specify a backing variable. So this is case underscore name. So this says, when we refer to it publicly, it'll be tf.name, but internally actually store this in a variable that's called underscore name. And it will take care of the details of, of using this inside your getter and setter when it writes them for you. But we'll just go ahead and create all the properties that we had promised we were going to create. And you can break those up into multiple lines, or you can just concatenate them all with commas and get it over with. All right. Let's see a warning here. This is simply to tell us that we still have more promises, incomplete implementation, more things that we said we were going to write and we still haven't written. So the first thing that we had talked about was an initialization function. So we had promised that we would write a knit with name. Okay. And this is going to follow the same sort of pattern as we did in the student. The first thing we did to do is work with the superclass and make sure that it can initialize the object. So we'll follow that same idea if self equals Super knit. Then we're in a place where we've got some useful memory that we can actually start using, storing some of these values in. So we're passing in a number of values. For each one, we just want to take the, value, the variable stored in self, the instance variable, and assign it to the value that we passed in from the, uh, from the definition of the function. Now, I've only taken in three parameters, but I've actually got five instance variables. So what I'm going to do for now is just 
do some sort of baseline initialization on the other values. So for the grades, what I want to do is create some sort of NS dictionary to, uh, to house the values when we get, have them. So we can create, we can allocate a new NS mutable dictionary and just initialize it without any values at this time. And we can do that same thing for office hours. But in this case, we're going to use a mutable array. And then once I have my object, I can return self, because I did promise that I'd return an ID. So this will basically initialize a TF object. And without finishing the rest of the contract there, we could jump back to main.m. And instead of greeting everybody, we could actually create a TF object at this time. So if we wanted to create a new TF, we could create a TF called Chris. We're actually use, using the pointer to store the value. We would need to allocate the object. And then we could use this init with name that we've just, oh, what did it? Now this is the same basic problem I had before. And uh, you may be already getting a step ahead of me. This is again, although I've written some code for this TF object, I haven't told this piece of code that that exists yet. So like I have up here to import student.h, I also want to import tf.h. And once I've added that, this should be much happier. Now it knows that there's an init with name. Okay. So for each of these, it's going to need a value. We can say that to follow the pattern, the name is Chris. The students is going to be the student's object that we've already created previously as an NS mutable array. And I can say that my favorite student is Alice. Except I don't have a student pointer in the way I wrote this this time. I'm going to tweak the previous code to make this work real quick. So previously, we had simply embedded the object directly into students as we created it. Instead, I'm going to create Alice in advance. And then I can add that object. And then I can once again use it. Here. Okay, so now we've created the new TF object. And it's telling me something else. Oh, it's just telling me that I've never used this, which is fine. We knew that. We've created it, but we haven't gotten far enough in our code to actually make use of that object. So that is a, a good warning. That's a good thing. All right. Let's actually get to the point where we have a little more functionality in this object. So one of the key things that the TF promised it would do is assign grades. So we said that was void grade. All right, so we're just going to, as a starting point, just assign some random grades initially rather than take the time to, to really go through the effort, which uh, may seem what it's like some of the other times as well. But So we're going to use some standard C functionality to assign these grades. SRAN time null is a pretty general construct, which is just going to initialize a random number generator. SRAN says seed the random number. Time 
just gives it some sort of random starting point, which is just the current clock time. So we've initialized the random number generator. The other key thing that we'll need to do because we're using, using this code is we will also need to, and I didn't import here, I need to go back still and import student.h, since so I'll be using that in here, but I'll also need to import the C standard library to get access to those random number functions. All right. So we've got an array of students. To grade each one, we're going to want to set up some sort of for loop again. We're going to be pulling out student objects. Each one will be temporarily stored in a variable called student. And we're going to use the student's object that we already have in memory as the array to start from. For each one, we're going to assign a grade, which in this case is just going to be random. But then we're going to have a, a little caveat here. So if this is my favorite student, I want to always give that student a four. So what we're going to do is take a look at the name of the student that we're currently working on. So I can say, Take the current student object, get the name property using its getter, and pass it a message of, because this is now an n a string, we can pass an n a string method of is equal to string, and we want to use the name of my favorite student. So self.favorite, favorite was, again, a student object. To get to the name, we can use a dot again and get down to the actual n a string, which is the name of the student. If that is all true, we're just going to decide the grade is a 4. And then once we have these grades created, we actually have to store them. So we're going to use the mutable dictionary that we created which is self.grades. We're going to send in a message of set value. And this is going to be set value for key. So like we said, this is essentially an associative array. It's all key value pairs. The value in this case is going to be the grade, uh, but it needs to be of type, it has to be an NS number object as opposed to just an integer. So we're going to create that real quickly by creating a new NS number object, number with int. Now you notice this is actually slightly different than we saw in other places where we'd had done an allocate and then an initialize. The big difference comes down to the memory management behind the scenes. This is using that auto-release pool that we had talked about, as opposed to creating the objects in a separate section of memory. A detail you don't need to worry about for a couple weeks, but just know that this is going to create our object for us much in the same way that alloc and init did for us, but a little more efficient for what we're doing right now. And then the key is just going to be, we'll store it under the student's name. And that's pretty much it for grading. So we're just going to assign a random value, override it if it's the favorite, store it in the dictionary. Outputting the grades is actually going to be very straightforward because we're pretty much just going to be using that nslog function for now just to get something out. So again, we start with the at in front of our quote because, again, this is an n a string. We're just going to spit out a little header real quick, grades. And then we've got this 
dictionary of grades, so we need to look at each of the items in the dictionary and print it. So we'll go back to a for loop. This gets a little interesting. So we're using for ID student. By using ID, we don't have to specify up front what sort of object we're going to be getting. That just tells us we're going to be getting some object back as we iterate over this array. It's a nice way to go when you get down, when you get into the future and you start looking at you know, subclassing objects, et cetera. You don't have to know the specific type, and you can actually do interesting things, like you could have an array of different types of objects and deal with them appropriately based on the type of object you come, with, uh, come up with. So it's often common to use ID instead of this explicit type if it's not that important for what you're doing. If you absolutely require that it's of a specific type, you probably do want things to break if the wrong type comes back. So we're going to get each student in self.grades and just do some quick printing. Again, with the formatters. So we'll take the student that we're iterating from, and then we're going to go into grades by sending it a message and get the object for a key. So for the specific student, we're going to send the message to the grades object to give me the object for that key. And that will get the grade for that student and print it out. You'll remember this is an object here because this is actually an NS number at that point. Yeah. OK. We've just got two more quick functions to implement uh, the TF, and then we can play some more with how we actually use these. All right, so real quick, adding office hours. We'll just do a self.ohs add object date. And outputting those will be very similar where we iterate again. The one thing where this does get a little more interesting is because we're using a date, we're actually going to need to use a formatter as well. So we'll use an NS date formatter. And we'll just call it formatter. Same idea where we allocate it, initialize it. But then we're going to use it by telling it what style of date we want to use. So we're going to set the date style to NS date formatter. We use long style for this. And now we can simply just iterate over the list to print all these out. using the formatter to actually string format the date. All right. So at this point, we've fully committed to our contract. We've implemented everything we're going to implement. I'll make this file available so you don't have to retype the whole thing watching the section video later. And we can get back to the main application and start using some of this stuff for some, some more interesting work. So we've got Chris as our TF. 
So the first thing we can do is we can actually reference items within the object. Because I've created the, the getters and setters, we can actually look at things like print out, for example, who is Chris's current favorite student? So I can get Chris favorite name. And while we're using the dot notation here, you'll remember from class that we could actually do all this with messages. This is just a, a convenience where I could say Chris favorite name and those messages are the same thing, but it's a little more messy having all those brackets in there, the dot notation, it seems to be a little cleaner and easier to work with. All right. The other thing we can do is add newly created students down the road. So say for example, I have a new student come along, David. In the past, we had done an allocation and then a knit with name, but we could actually use the other option where student, we said you could just do an init on and then manually set the properties as well. So I could use the same idea of david.name is david, david.age equals 34, for example. And once I've got that, I can add David to the array. So this gets a little interesting here. So I had created the array, and then I created Chris using that array, but now I've added data, David after the fact. Now this gets into where we talk about why would I use copy versus strong or versus assign, depending on what you're doing. And this is a very interesting detail in that this will add David to that same array, but because I've only stored the pointer to the array in the Chris object, Chris now knows about David, even though we haven't told Chris anything anywhere after the last time we printed something from Chris. We haven't told him otherwise that things have changed. But because it's a pointer to the same object, by manipulating that object in memory, we've manipulated what the class actually knows about. Does that make sense? I got a few knots. Okay. So then I can also do some of the other functions that we created. I can run my grading. I can output those grades. I could add some office hours. This is an NS date, so this gets interesting. So we can't just put up the date in straight text. They won't know what that is. We actually have to build this date object. But we can do that again with this concept of you know, giving the class name and giving it a, uh, constructor function here. So we have date with natural language string, which sounds very natural. And we can pass it in something like today's date. Make sure I close all my brackets. And I can do the same thing to add a, a second one. Assuming I'll come back next week. And then we can print out those office hours as well. So this has been a lot of code. I don't see a lot of warning messages or error messages on the side, so I feel like we're in good shape. I'm going to go ahead and run this and just make sure that everything is doing what we're expecting to be doing. So again, this is coming out at the very bottom. So we had created the Alice object. We had printed the name, 
We did the grading. We printed out the grades. Those all came out. You'll see that Alice automatically got a four because we had overridden that. The office hours went in. It took my 2 slash 29 and decided that was February 29th, and everything came up nice and clean. So, so we had a few key ideas in here. We created a new class. We had to reference our previous classes. We did a lot of init alloc. We made some objects right on the fly using the, uh, the auto-release pool without having to worry about the details of what was going on. We did a lot of message passing and used NSLog a lot. We used the formatters in NSLog. A lot of good stuff here. And if folks have just five more minutes, I want to show you one thing that I think is really neat, and it's the idea of categories. So in regular object-oriented programming, you have objects that inherit from another base object. And if you want to change the functionality, there's a few things you can do. You can get a copy of the source code for your object, and you can just change the source code. You can add a new method, right? That's not always practical. This might be something that was pre-compiled, you got from someone else, or it's used in a number of applications, and you just can't break that functionality. So the next logical thought in an object-oriented model is inherit from that object and add your functionality to the inherited copy. And that's a, a nice idea as well. But then you're dealing with a new object, which is slightly different, and that might not be the best way to go. There's a third option in Objective-C, which I, I haven't seen in other languages, but uh, I only use a certain subset of languages, so that could explain it. But it's this idea of categories. And what you're doing with categories is you can add new methods. You can't add instance variables, but you can add new methods to existing objects in the running space, in, in the runtime environment. And this can be any object. You could extend NSString and add new functionality to it, even though it's you know, this base object that you don't have any source code to and you're not going to. You can still add new methods to it. So let's take a moment and look at that idea. So I had hinted earlier, there's this idea of a description function, which is sort of the, the built-in pretty printing function for an object. If you define it, a description function, rather than seeing, like in our previous example, when you printed the Alice string object, it showed you this giant ID number and then the word Alice, which is fine. It, it gave us an idea of what we were doing, but it's not necessarily the prettiest bit of code. Let's extend our student object by creating a category that will implement this new function description. And this is actually relatively straightforward. So we'll go again to new file. And you'll see that Objective-C category is available as one of the choices. It asks you what your category is. So in this case, I'm just going to call it description because that's the function I want to add to it. But you could call it whatever. You could call it, you know, if this is for your big project, you could call it category your big project and have a number of methods that it's handling. And it's going to be a category on student. So we're going to extend the student functionality with some other methods. It's just asking where I want to save the files it's going to create. And you'll see that it's created two new files. And I'm just going to open this up for a moment so you can see the full name. The convention is class plus category. So it's student plus description is the name of the file. And if we look at the header, you'll see that it's very similar. It's got this interface student, but then in parentheses it says description. And that tells it that this is the category that we're going to be working with. Now I just want to add one function. So I have to tell it at least what that function is. So it's going to be an NS string object called description. Just promising that this function is going to exist in my .m file, and it's going to return a string. In my .m file, I now have to implement that. <clears throat> 
All right. So this is going to be very straightforward as well. All I want to do is make the string pretty and return it. So I'm going to return an NS string that is created using string with format. And I am going to use this format. I'm going to say name percent at new line age percent d new line and show self.name and self.age. And I misspelled in a string. All right. So this is very format, uh, very, very quick and easy. So the student class already exists. It already has some instance variables, name and age. I'm just going to format them using this format here to have a nice little block of text that talks about the object rather than just a giant ID number. And every time description is called, that will happen. So I've got to tell main that this exists now. It doesn't just magically know that I've extended this. So in addition to importing student.h and tf.h, I'll import this new header, student.description. And then I can actually use that in my code. So right after I create the TF object, is that where I'm, did you? I could actually do a log on the object itself as well. I'm sorry. Not the TF object. I need to do this on the student object. So I had created David. Let's do it right after that point. So David is just a student object. It's not any different than it was before. But now, actually, I can be even fancier. I can do nslog. Print the object, David. And because description is this special function that automatically returns a string, it knows that this should output, using the format I just created, the object. So if we run this code, you'll see embedded in our output we have name colon David and age colon 34 without otherwise influencing the student object. So this, this student object could have been code I received from somebody else, you know, just checked out a repository. They don't know that I've modified their code, but I've added this additional functionality right on the fly using a category. Yes? So the question is, would I say David description? Now, I could say David description. It's, the, it's functionally going to be the same. I've sort of relied on the fact that when you just specify a raw object, it knows to take the description automatically. But that is functionally the same as saying David description right there. That's just the magic of the fact that I used description as my method name that let me get away with not doing that. All right. Well, that's what I had for today. I appreciate folks going a little bit long here tonight. I hope you learned a little something. I hope Objective-C looks a little more familiar at this point. And uh, for those that are sticking around in a half an hour, we will have um, design reviews. So thank you. <laughs>